Welcome to Back to Health, your source for the latest in health, wellness, and medical care, keeping you informed so you can make informed healthcare choices for yourself and your whole family. Back to Health features conversations about trending health topics and medical breakthroughs from our team of world-renowned physicians at Wild Cornell Medicine. I'm Melanie Cole, and joining me today is Dr. Matthew Robbins. He's an associate professor of neurology at Wild Cornell Medical College, Cornell University, and an associate attending neurologist at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Wild Cornell Medical Center. And he's here to talk to us today about long COVID and headache disorders. Dr. Robbins, it's a pleasure to have you join us as we were speaking a little off the air. I find headaches so interesting. And now as we're learning more and more about long COVID and the complications that that is causing for so many people, I'd like you to put these two together for us. How common are headaches as a symptom of long COVID? Well, thanks, Melanie, and I'm delighted to be with you and to share this information with our conversation. You know, headaches, even separate from COVID and long COVID, are such a common symptom of some of the most common disorders that people experience worldwide. Migraine is probably the most common headache condition that comes to medical attention. And there are probably more than 40 million people in the United States alone and 1 billion people in the world who experience migraine in any given year. So already we're starting with this background of really frequent and severe headache condition that is prevalent all over the world. And then you throw COVID into the mix where we've, of course, seen a lot of neurological symptoms arise out of the consequences of having such an infection, and then it sort of amplifies the whole situation. So we do know that headache is one of the most common symptoms that people can experience once the initial COVID infection sort of goes away. Long COVID is sort of broadly defined as having symptoms that last at least two months that start sometime after having a COVID infection and something that really can't be explained by something else. And headache is one of the top symptoms that we see in long COVID. But often when we see headache after COVID, it's often not by itself. It's often with other symptoms too, such as dizziness, sleeping problems, thinking problems or cognitive disorders, fatigue, even numbness and tingling and so on. So that's one of the ways in which we could sometimes distinguish between headache arising out of a COVID infection versus, say, headache condition that happens on its own, such as with migraine, is in sort of the company that it keeps and all these other symptoms that develop. Wow, that was so interesting and an excellent explanation for this. So here's a big question, Dr. Robbins. What is a headache? It's hard to take for granted that very question, so that's really smart. Headache is a symptom. It's a symptom of when there is pain or discomfort or some type of abnormal sensory experience that is unpleasant in the head. The head includes the upper part of the neck, the face, the eyes, so it's very nonspecific to location. And it's very important to know that headache, which is almost a universal symptom, there's no one who doesn't experience headache of some sort in their life, is different than sort of a condition where headache is the main event, such as migraine, for example. You know, migraine is an inherited neurological condition where headache is the most common and often the most debilitating symptom. But typically, there are many other symptoms, such as sensory sensitivity, like light and sound and smell sensitivity, things being worsened by movement, nausea, sometimes other neurological symptoms. So even how we conceptualize headache alone is kind of misconstrued and often leads to stigma against patients because who hasn't experienced headache once in a while? I think from some innocuous cause or having a sinus infection or having the flu or even having COVID, which most of the time doesn't cause long-term problems. But there are certain disorders that feature headache as a main symptom, but they are conditions or even thought to be diseases on their own. For example, migraine alone, you know, most people of migraine have migraine that's very occasional. They have attacks once in a while. Maybe there are certain triggers like something they thought was dietary or with sleep deprivation or stress or relaxation after stress or something hormonal. But then there are people who have really tough chronic migraine where they're having headache and other neurological symptoms almost 24-7, and it's like a disease. So even the spectrum of just a headache condition is so variable. And because headache has been such a common symptom to arise after COVID as part of long COVID in general, it sort of reinforces how little we know, but how much more we need to appreciate about people who have headache conditions like migraine or cluster headache or after a traumatic brain injury or concussion in the more general sense. 
Well, headaches can be so debilitating. I know that when I've had a few, you know, it's just something you feel like you can't do anything else until that's solved. Now, the ones that we're talking about for long COVID, are these mostly random, Dr. Robbins, or are there risk factors? Is there any prediction that this person who might have been susceptible to migraines before or who might get headaches for something easily before might be somebody that would suffer this as a complication? That is a very important question, Melanie. I think we don't know entirely. We know sort of more broadly, and it seems to be that the risk of developing long COVID, including neurological symptoms like headache is lower if you're vaccinated for COVID, if you're eligible for an antiviral treatment like Paxlovid and you have taken it, if you had COVID more recently with some type of Omicron derivative rather than Delta, Alpha, Beta, or the very early variants that might have led to this to happen more commonly. That being said, there isn't a clear relationship with the intensity or severity of the initial COVID infection and the long-term risk of long COVID. I think what we have observed in our practices is that people who have a history of, say, migraine or maybe a strong family history of migraine may be more likely to develop headache arising from a COVID infection. And the hypothesis, what we think might be the case, is that there's a genetic risk that exists already, and then you get this infection, and then that sort of activates this biology that was lurking beneath the surface all along. So that has to be borne out in future studies. But that is something that we've seen from infections in the past. For example, in the neurology world and many patient advocacy organizations focus on this condition that's called new daily persistent headache. It was something that was originally described by a Canadian neurologist, Dr. Vanast, in the 1980s. And back then it was picked up by places like the National Enquirer and other places that sensationalized it in a way, but it was described in association with Epstein-Barr virus infection, where headache could arise after some infection. And often, just like with this new daily persistent headache or with long COVID and headache that can develop thereafter, often the headache problem is way worse than the initial infection ever was. So we have a base of experience from this and those lessons we've been applying to COVID. Dr. Robbins, you already said this at the very beginning of this episode, but I'd like you to reiterate for patients, how do they know that their headaches are a symptom of long COVID and not something else? Can you just re-say what you said at the beginning, putting that together with dizziness or they've just had COVID, kind of put it together again for us? Yeah, I think the clue is typically if headache is very frequent or even continuous sort of in the aftermath of having a COVID infection, and often if it is linked with other symptoms that may be neurological, like fatigue, like having a sleep problem, maybe like having generalized pain in muscles, like dizziness. So it's likely linked in this complex of symptoms. It's hard to know how specific that is to the virus because people with migraine also have what doctors and scientists use this term called comorbidity. If you have migraine, you're more likely to have chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia or anxiety or a sleep disturbance. But we see that very clearly more in the same time frame where they all happen all at once together in the setting of long COVID. So that might be a clue. Of course, an important thing to say to our audience is that a clinician, a physician, a doctor, someone should also be helping to figure this out for our patients, of course. But those are the general trends that we've noticed. Well, thank you for that. Now, what about treatments? Are there any medically-based treatments that have been shown to work? Are we just looking at Tylenol or Motrin? What has been shown not to work? And what have you guys found works pretty well? Yeah, I think that is an important question because we haven't found a treatment that's specific for long COVID necessarily, especially for neurological symptoms. So the way in which we manage, say someone has very frequent headaches after a COVID infection, and we say that you may have long COVID, you know, if the headaches resemble otherwise migraine with some of the symptoms that I mentioned earlier with nausea and vomiting and pain that might be more throbbing and changing in its location on the head and worsened by movement and being sensitive to light and noise and smell and so on, then we use migraine treatments to help treat this post-COVID or long-COVID headache condition. And often that's very successful. In migraine, thankfully, in our world, we have so many new treatments over the last few years that have really exploded and have been very specific for migraine and are very well tolerated. And the fact that they often work in this situation suggests that 
in long COVID, migraine biology in the brain is being activated and therefore gives us an opportunity to use our existing and newer treatments for migraine that may work. What about home treatments? What would you like patients, listeners to know if they are somebody who's suffering these headaches and maybe they're just racking it up to headaches they've suffered before or putting it to long COVID? Maybe they've seen a doctor or not. What do you like them to do at home? What are some tried and true things, methods that can work to help relieve some of those headaches? The first thing I would like to emphasize is that it should never really be done on their own. If someone is really suffering with headache, we learn these lessons for migraine over many, many decades, is that we are working on making sure primary care doctors are well-educated to treat headache problems, including migraine. There's obviously many, many specialists in neurology. I myself, I'm a headache specialist neurologist, so I spent a year doing what's called a fellowship where I studied only headache, and there are close to 800 of us across the country. So it's very important to try to see someone who might be able to help and never feel like you have to be at home doing it alone. There are non-prescription treatments that are useful. There are certain over-the-counter supplements that have some evidence for migraine that we often apply to long COVID, certain devices that are even over-the-counter that are approved or cleared by the FDA for headache conditions. Certainly, different tools can be very helpful for someone to do at home to bring to their provider, keeping a diary, looking at triggers, seeing if there's a relationship in women to their periods, and so on. So I think often it's great when we see a very empowered patient who comes to us with information that that we can then use together to make people better. Well, I know I'm not alone when I say that headaches can be scary. And when you get one, whether or not you get them regularly or not, I mean, right away, a lot of us go, oh, brain tumor or stroke or something along those lines. I mean, I know I do. Maybe I'm just a little bit out there that way, but I'm sure a lot of people do. But I want to ask you, you recently represented Wild Cornell Medicine on Capitol Hill, Dr. Robbins. Would you tell us what that was about and what you shared? That's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. So I have been a participant for several years with this organization called the Alliance for Headache Disorders Advocacy, which is a group of doctors and other clinicians and patients and advocates who all together go to Capitol Hill and advocate for our patients to just make their care better to have more research opportunities and to have more funding for people with headache disorders, to have better services for those who are disabled from it to be able to manage their lives. So we went this year, and I was also happy to represent the American Headache Society where I am on the board of directors. And of course, while Cornell, we had a few different asks. One important ask was about supporting long COVID headache research because it's such a prevalent problem. And some of our discussion today underlied how little we know about it and how there aren't really specific treatments for it. So that was one of our asks to have more recognition, have more funding for research through the NIH and the NINDS, which is the neurology wing of the NIH. And we had other asks too, including trying to safeguard access to special education services for children with migraine and other headache disorders, looking to see if we could even create a caucus for congressional members who might be interested in helping us more frequently and reliably, and then also looking to expand on the support that's already been given to veterans with headache, because there is this wonderful VA centers of excellence process and system that exists for our veterans who have headache disorders, which could be related to their deployment or just related to their medical illnesses. And to increase those resources would be great. In years past, we also looked to advocate for underserved populations. So it's really a wonderful organization. I feel very empowered to go, including alongside some of my own patients who have very tough headache disorders, who've been empowered to advocate and stand alongside us together to do so. What excellent work. Thank you so much for all that kind of work really helps advance the situation. And as I said before, it can be so debilitating. I'd like you to wrap it up, Dr. Robbins, with your best advice for people that suffer from headaches and suffer from headaches that may be related to long COVID. What would you like them to know? I'd like them to know that you can be helped and We have a lot of different treatments that will help people be better, have a better quality of life. And there are a lot of general medical care practitioners and specialists who are empowered to really help. And I've seen so many patients get so much better when this situation has arised. And we're really grateful that investment in science by the government through the NIH has really led to new discoveries to treat many of our most common neurological disorders like migraine that we can use in circumstances like this, but we certainly need more ways to go. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Robbins, for joining us today. What a fascinating topic this was. And while Cornell Medicine continues to see our patients in person as well as through video visits, and you can be confident of the safety of your appointments at Wild Cornell Medicine. That concludes today's episode of Back to Health. We'd like to invite our audience to download, subscribe, rate, and review Back to Health on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. And for more health tips, go to wildcornell.org and search podcasts and parents. Don't forget to check out our Kids HealthCast. I'm Melanie Cole. Thanks so much for joining us today. Every parent wants what's best for their children. But in the age of the Internet, it can be difficult to navigate what is actually fact-based or pure speculation. Cut through the noise with Kids HealthCast, featuring Wild Cornell Medicine's expert physicians and researchers, discussing a wide range of health topics, providing information on the latest medical science. Finally, a podcast to help you make informed choices for your family's health and wellness. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, don't forget to rate us five stars. All information contained in this podcast is intended for informational and educational purposes. The information is not intended nor suited to be a replacement or substitute for professional medical treatment or for professional medical advice relative to a specific medical question or condition. We urge you to always seek the advice of your physician or medical professional with respect to your medical condition or questions. While Cornell Medicine makes no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in this podcast, and any reliance on such information is done at your own risk. Participants may have consulting, equity, board board membership, or other relationships with pharmaceutical, biotech, or device companies unrelated to their role in this podcast. No payments have been made by any company to endorse any treatments, devices, or procedures. And while Cornell Medicine does not endorse, approve, or recommend any product, service, or entity mentioned in this podcast, opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the speaker and do not represent the perspectives of Wild Cornell Medicine as an institution.